Since we got out late, I'll wait another minute or two. But yeah. <laughs> The presentations are on Dropbox. We can't get there for a learning site. Okay, maybe they're going to make that available later. Um, um, Tim sent out an email. Um, yeah, there's a lot of links in there. Um, I'm going to have that. I can see it. Yeah. Because that's how I got it. They already have an account. So here's where. Um, Okay, I'll start in about 10 seconds. Countdown. Get ready to roll the ball. I hear more people come down the halls. Okay. I'm Crystal Nielsen. Hello, welcome. It's morning. How many of us are morning people? I am not raising my hands, but anyway. <laughs> But it's a beautiful surrounding today. It's a beautiful morning. So this session is an accessible course. So easy, your grandma could do it. And the reason I titled it that is that, oh dear, come on. Maybe this needs to be turned on since I'm the first one today. And it's still not going. Well, I'll just do it manually. One of the things I do is also provide tech support to the sessions that I'm going to. Did it advance manually? There were some problems in... Well, try to see if it advances manually with the arrow key or something. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Okay. If I spot David Spiel or Jerry Lewis, I'll... Okay. Okay. All right. So, I have actually tried to help my mother and my aunt in their 80s program their smartphones. Fun experience. They retain it for about a week and then... They <laughs> so, anyway. But, the point is, is that I did do it. Um, and it was successful for a short time. Um, hopefully, you can, you can use that same kind of principle to make your course accessible. It's not that hard to, to sit down and do it. It just takes a little time. Oop. Okay. Rather than burning your laptop, your computer, and saying, I don't want to have to do anything like this, then, yeah. I'm going to try to make it easy for you. Let me ask before we go on uh, further, how many of you, um, I heard somebody say they work in a disability service center. Okay, a couple people. How many are faculty? How many are instructional designers? Anything else? Okay. How many of you have um, employed some kind of accessibility in your courses? Okay, okay, so some. 
So I may be preaching to the choir a tiny bit, but I'll try to um, cover anything that, that you have questions about. Feel free to ask any questions um, along the way. So now it's moving on its own. That's great. Um, <laughs> so you probably know that the accessibility um, guidelines that we have are, are driven by laws. Um, they affect institutions because most of us accept federal financial aid. And so that's why we need to comply with those. And uh, those also inform the WCAG guidelines. I pronounce it WCAG. Does anybody else pronounce it differently? Okay. Um, World Wide Web Consortium, W3C, um, created the World uh, Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, and, and the federal laws now point to the WCAG guidelines. Um, and so it's kind of a double whammy there. Oh, you did it once. Okay. Great. Maybe? Yeah. <laughs> okay. We'll just go back. Okay. So the WCAG guidelines, in case you're not familiar with them, are for um, your content to be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So let's talk a little bit about your audience. Assistive technology, such as a screen reader, um, can be... Is that you again? Did I do? <laughs> I'm, <sorry. laughs> I'm like, woo! <laughs> Jane, okay. stop this crazy thing. All right. Stop. Okay, that's all right. Um, so, this is what a screen reader technology would look like. I mean, they, they, there's different variations. Um, but you notice that this individual has this, this extra keyboard down here. And, and he or she can use that to navigate a web page. Oh, now we're going backward. Should we dance? <laughs> That's all right. Okay, now the screen is really advancing on its own. That's crazy. Okay, so the aggregate of studies show that up to 20% of internet users or web users at any given time um, are having some accessibility issues. That may be due to actual uh, actual impairment, such as being deaf, severely hard of hearing, mildly hard of hearing, or they're simply in a noisy room. It's just their environment at the time is making it so that they, they can't access it. But a lot of us still use the accessibility tools. I, for one, almost always watch movies with the subtitles on, especially if it's like British accents and all that kind of thing, so, or if it's one of my husband's, you know, guy flicks or sci-fi flicks, I'm like, I'm not understanding this. So um, there's a little bit of difference between subtitles and captions, and the difference between open captions and closed captions. Open captions are basically burned into the video, you can't turn them off. Closed captions, you can toggle them on or off. Now, either those or a transcript will meet the requirements, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. Is the transcripts tend to be more accurate? Because they're not interpreted by a, interpreted by a machine. It depends on the caption software. Right, right. And, and having the audio description is, is much more useful to the hearing impaired person. Um, that's what this would be, the description of non-dialogue. So, for example, um, you know, if two people are talking and then there's a dog barking in the background, the audio description would say dog barking or, um, you know, train whistle blows or whatever like that so that it's providing a little bit more context um, to the person to understand what's going on. As opposed to just the subtitles, which are just the dialogue. Yeah, but you're right, providing a transcript, it also depends on if it's a live, um, live, presentation or recorded, so, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. Good question. So, 
Anybody here from Oregon State University? Um, they've done several research studies in, um, in I was going to say cahoots, that's not the right word, in collaboration with <laughs> Three Play Media. Um, they found that seven out of ten students without hearing impairments use captions at least some of the time. And three out of four students who used those captions said that they do so as a learning aid. Many times they say it helps them focus. Uh, and, and I am the same way. If I'm, if I'm trying to absorb new information, I'm, I'm wanting to track as much of that as I can by both the visual and the, as, and especially if it's a topic that is a little bit beyond me, you know, a little bit um, out of my league. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the principles. Are there any other questions before we keep moving? It also helps if you have if you're going to write quiz questions on your own video. Back to your transcript. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what, what I talked about yesterday. Okay, so the principles. Are your images accessible? If they are not accessible, it's like this poor little invisible man here. They're not really um, seeing anything uh, on that page. So alt text, an alternative way to, for someone to know what an image depicts. Alt text explains when an explanation is necessary. So for instance, if it's for a botany class that you have this picture, you're going to want to put something in your alt text such as, hydrangeas thrive best with full sun in the morning, or whatever that information is that they're needing to know from that image. If it's just pretty flowers that are a decoration on your page, you can just write flowers in your alt text, or do something that's called null alt text. It's just two quote marks, no space in between. And what that means is when the screen reader technology is reading the web page content for the individual, it knows there's nothing really here that you need to be concerned about. And so it just kind of skips over it. Um, otherwise, if there's nothing there, then, then the screen reader is saying, yeah, there's an image here, but I don't really know what's in there. And so you're kind of, stuck. I'm like, there must be a ghost here because I am not touching anything. <laughs> okay. So what happens if you don't use alt tags? The HTML code behind the scenes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> That's how I feel. <laughs> that was perfect. Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, what we ended up doing yesterday was just going to the slide, the slide slides. Oh page, yes. I might. I might do that. Still big enough for us to see. I don't know why I want to do this. Okay. Of course, this has been recording right now, being recorded right now. So, oh my gosh. Okay. The URL gets read out loud, okay? So the visually impaired person is going to hear HTTP colon slash slash blah, 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 blah for whatever that URL was for that image. And you may think, well, I didn't have a, um, a URL for my image, a link. Well, yes, you did, because anytime you're putting web content in there, there has to be some kind of coding to tell it where to find that image in your files. And so that's where it's going. And yeah, really? <laughs> uh, it's annoying. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm going to end the presentation and <laughs> just use this mode. Let's see if I can make this bigger, though. Nope, that's not working. It's just going to be what it is. Okay. So, infographics. I love infographics. And most of us are visual learners. We just, we just 
we love the visuals. Um, but how to make it accessible. You need to provide that same information in descriptive text that would maybe point to another document, an HTML document, that would describe everything that's in this, this uh, infographic. Yes? So, in this case, I mean, there's a lot going on in this. Yes. So, it really, the, the point is to, to describe the point. Yes. Of it, right? Yes. And not like, oh, there's these folders, and mm -hmm. then there's this thing coming out of the wall, and, you know, all that kind of stuff, because that wouldn't necessarily be right. meaningful anyway. Right. No, it's the information that you want to convey, not necessarily the presentation of the information. Well, yeah. A non-impaired student would look at this graphic and not know what it is they're supposed to get out of it. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> what would be the... Yeah, some, some infographics can be pretty busy. There are, there are, right? Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. But if you're, if you're, for instance, doing a, uh, maybe you have an assignment where students are supposed to use Canva or PictoChart to create infographics, which I think is a good assignment. Um, if they're going to be sharing those with the rest of the class, I think it's a good idea to be compliant and also have them provide did that just skip on its own? It is. That is wild. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> it must just be that this uh, keyboard on this laptop is just extra sensitive. If I bump the table or something, it must be what happened. Anyway, I'll have to let the, the yeah, the techie people know. Anyway, um, yes. It's good practice to have your students also make their content accessible if they're going to be presenting it to the rest of the class. Um, wow. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I don't think you touched a table. I didn't. I'm like, whoa. <laughs> we'll go, we'll go, we'll go. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, where was I going with this? Probably my grandmother. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Exactly. Um, a lot of times, students who have impairments do not necessarily contact the Disability Services Office to say, I need an accommodation or, or whatever. Um, there's just, they feel a little bit of a stigma about it. And so, even though they may not have informed the office about it and they may not have informed you as the teacher, um, like I said, it's good practice, and, and to me, it's good teaching to help your students know that accessibility is a thing. And, and you know, when they're going out and graduating and going into their discipline, they may need to do this very thing. And so I think the onus is on us as teachers to, to make sure that that's happening. Okay. Any other questions about images? Yes. Well, I just have a comment. Um, the gentleman over here said that Somebody looking at that might not understand what they're supposed to, what you're mm -hmm. supposed to get out of it. But one uh, way to make those accessible is when you're designing infographics to create them from an outline. And uh, then that way you know that there's a logical connection to each one of the elements. Mm -hmm. Because the temptation of some of these tools like Canva is to go, oh, wait a minute, I can put this right here. Mm -hmm. Or move it around. And you might, can, uh, sometimes the, uh, New creators will uh, can make something look more confusing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good. Okay. Now we're going to talk a little bit about accessible links. So the individual who's using a screen reader technology will use the tab key to um, skim through a web page and find the links. I mean, obviously, if they're a student, they need to read the whole page, right? Um, but if they're going back to look for something and they want to, oh, I remember that link was on this page, I think. They're tabbing through to find those links. So, one principle is embed your links on descriptive words or phrases rather than click here or more info or details here, that kind of thing. Let me show you an example. So up at the top here, let me make that bigger. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna go back to presentation mode since it's got a mind of its own anyway. 
<laughs> okay. Have you ever heard of lorem ipsum? Mm -hmm. yeah. There's bacon ipsum. Good. That's, That's better. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here, here, here. So when that person is tabbing through the page to find the link to whatever they were looking for, there's three here's on there. Where are they pointing to? That's, that's annoying. That's that really kind of look. So rather than that, do you spell it out on a descriptive word or phrase? Chapters one to three of your OER textbook. OERs, yes? Mm -hmm. News outlets available via the library. APA style. Whatever it is that you're wanting students to go to, make it descriptive. So a screen reader will just uh, be going along with an awkward break in the sentence? What it would do is it would say, for instance up here, it would say, bacon, ipsum, delore, omit, link, here, sausage, ribeye, it would say It would insert link. Mm -hmm. And it would spell it out. The, the, it depends on if you have the alt tag and all that. But the, uh, this one, it's going to, because remember when I showed the HTTP kind of thing? If you don't have that kind, actually, that's my next screen. Um, yeah. So whether it, if it's here, it's going to say here. If it's a link like that, it's going to say that out loud. HTTP, colon, slash, slash, www.a or Amazon, they'll probably say Amazon. But it's, I mean, it's clunky. And so the bottom one will say... Link, constructing thing. usable websites. It will say link. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Same thing with those images. It's going to say image, purple hydrangeas, or whatever. Um, and for that reason, you don't have to write image of purple hydrangeas, because that'll be repetitious. Just and say... So for this, it would say link, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you don't necessarily say, need to say link to constructed, constructing usable websites, just because the, the machine is going to say link or image. And yeah. then, I just don't know how any of this works, and then when, when the machine says that, then the student can say go there, mm -hmm. and the student can opt to go there or yeah. not if they mm -hmm. don't want to do yeah. that, and then, and then the screen reader will go there. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And from a standpoint of your sighted users, which link would you rather would you rather see? I mean, yeah. it, it just makes it much more graphically pleasing to the eye. So I, I do this even in my emails. I will embed the link on a word or phrase. Of, you know, if I'm sending out a link to a faculty member to say, go to this help resource, I'm putting it on. You know, I'm saying the title of whatever it is. So so it's much more user friendly. Yeah. Okay. The concept of front loading. This provides the most important information at the beginning of a link in a bulleted list. For instance, Chronicle of Higher Education and then information about it. News outlets, information. Rather than having it embedded, remember the here, here, here stuff where it was all in those sentences? Um, whereas this, when the student with the screen reader is tabbing through to find the links, they're reading the most important information first. And again, I think this is also useful for your sighted users. It's, it's just that that's the way I do my bulleted list now is to um, front load that. Another part of that concept is uh, when you have multiple links that are kind of similar. So if, if you wanted to say, Help Center for Google Docs, Help Center for Microsoft Word, Help Center for Open Office. All three of those are starting with the word Help Center, and it's just a little bit more tedious for the person using that screen reader. So front load the most important information at the beginning of that link. Are there any questions? I'm seeing kind of, oh, <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's a little difficult to do this. Um, another, another way you might see this on a page, um, if I went out to our university website, there's probably a contact us on there, right? Um, but that might be for the university as a whole. Then there might be a contact us 
in the Instructional Design and Technology Office. There might be a contact us for the Help Center. Um, so, so you can't necessarily tell your whole university how to do this, I mean, unless you're the webmaster. But, um, but yeah, the, the trying to say contact Instructional Design and Technology or something like that. Yeah, I mean, these principles apply a lot to website, good website design, too. Right. Which makes total sense. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Image links. So, functional images are something that is going to convey uh, user action rather than just information. Um, so, you want to provide alt text that gives the purpose rather than just describing it. So I'm not going to say Northwest Nazarene logo, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to just say Northwest Nazarene University home. I don't necessarily need to say home page even. They're, they understand that means home page. So when, it, when the screen reader comes across this, it's going to say link, Northwest Nazarene University home. And so they know I can press that image link. That's a functional image. So okay. the, reader, the reader will actually pick up the words in the logo? Uh, no. If you have any, sometimes we're fond of using text um, in an image. I mean, you know, the quote of the day or something like that, and it's, and it's all, or just maybe you've created um, banners for your course, mm -hmm. and it's all text banners. Mm -hmm. um, you want to make sure that those have alt text um, so that they, so that the user knows this is not only an image, but it's also a link to somewhere, and if I click it, it's going to take me there. Yeah. Yeah. I'll show you an example in a minute um, from one of my web pages, my Canvas site. I've, you know, I created banners for my modules, and then I, I put alt text on there so they can know that what's, what that is. And it's just like an infographic. An infographic or just a text-based um, image. Either way, you want to provide that information to the individual. I have my TAs, um, they, I, I use the word accessibility. They know what that word means now. Mm -hmm. I say you, you just need to accessibility these PowerPoints for English 2010. Okay, so they have to go in and every chart, every image, whatever, they're providing the descriptive text on there. Um, and I will say that my experience with publisher content has been that usually it's not accessible. Um, at least, at least the older content. I don't know if newer content is getting better, um, but a lot of times faculty are still using the you know 2012 edition of the textbook, and and it's it's definitely not accessible. And so, um, I highly recommend trying to hire student workers if you can, um, but because. The, it does take a lot of work to do something like that. If you have, you know, a 16-week semester and you have 16 PowerPoints, that's a lot of work to go through and make all of those images accessible. Um, but it's good practice and it complies with the law. You don't ever want to be caught uh, having to be reactive instead of proactive. Um, I mean, we, our university, we have a small university with, you know, 1,200 students undergrad. Um, and we have... Um, a nearly blind student on campus this semester. And our disability services office contacted all the faculty of the courses that she was going to take and said, I'm available to help. Instructional design technology is available to help. And like only two of them said, oh yeah. And then one came panic into my office. I just got assigned this course last week and now I found out I have a blind person. What am I going to do? Calm down. It's okay. We got it. So, Yeah. Doing retroactive stuff is not fun. <laughs> okay. Is your organizational structure accessible? So presentational attributes such as font size or color or using something like boldface or italic, uh, that doesn't convey anything to the screen reader user. So it may look like this to you and to your sighted students, and it just looks like that to, I mean, to, to the screen reader reading it out. 
they're not noticing anything. And so, you know, if you have if you have all the important information up here, and then they have no idea what the structure of the page is. What's most important to know? So, what you want to do is use headings in your platform. Uh, Blackboard has headings. Microsoft Word has headings. Canvas has headings. Uh, pretty, they, or they might call it styles. It's either styles or headings. But instead of just saying, I'm going to bump this up to size 18, and I'm going to make it purple, whatever, um, that's not going to work. Yeah? So if, I, I would like to know what the screen reader says on this. So All About a Little Lamb is, is a header two and the poem is a header four, um, and then Bacon is in this paragraph, mm -hmm. right? What does the screen reader say? How does it differentiate for the listener? Okay, yes, you made my next point. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, so um, FYI in Canvas, uh, and in Blackboard, but, but Canvas I know, the page title is always heading one. So, so whatever you put in the title, you're not going to have to put in the heading style there because it's automatic. The, the cascading style sheets, the CSS in Canvas is automatically making your page title heading one. So you start with header two. And so you have to use these in hierarchical order because if I were to put that in H2, heading two, and then this one is heading four, and I see faculty do that, I, like, I tend to do that at the beginning because um, maybe I didn't like the, the look of heading three. I don't like heading four. Um, but that organizational structure gets messed up. And the student goes, um, was there a heading three that I missed? I, I'm kind of lost. So you want to go in hierarchical order. And um, what the screen reader is going to read for you is heading one, all about the lamp. Heading two, the poem. Bacon, Ibsen, blah, blah, blah. Heading one or heading two, the author. Da, 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 da. So, so, and they can also tab through those headers to find the organizational structure of the page, um, to to get a feel for what the page is. I uh, I worked at Boise State University for four years, and their disability resource center. Um, one of the individuals there is blind, and he did us the favor slash horror of um, using a screen reader to go through Blackboard page for us once. It was awful. Mm -hmm. It was awful trying to navigate between the navigation and the links and the da 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 da. And anytime, anytime it was kind of weird, he'd have to go back and start at the top. It was just tedious. So the easier you can make your structure for your students, the better. Sorry, this was just a little light bulb moment. It's like, okay, so I, choose, I can choose header one, header two, header three, header four, knowing that it's hierarchical. And then if I don't like the way that font looks, I can adjust the font, the color, the bold, the whatever, but it will still say header one, header two, header three, header four. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But you just don't want to do those attributes on their own. Right. Yeah. You also don't want to use color on its own um, to convey something. If you say, you know, click the red check mark, I don't know where the red check mark is. Um, so you just want to be careful there. I also tend to um, avoid green and red. Unfortunately, my university's colors are red and black. So <laughs> anyway, um, but if people are colorblind, they tend to be colorblind on green or red. And so just want to be careful with that. OK. I didn't put in a whole lot of information about captioning tools here. Um, how many of you have ever done videos and had them captioned? OK. And you've used these tools up here usually, maybe? OK. So Canvas Studio, actually, um, that, that's an add-on to Canvas. And it has a feature where it will automatically caption. You can request the captions. And it presents them about 85% accuracy. Um, you just need to go in and edit the punctuation usually. And sometimes it misunderstands a word here and there. Um, very similar to YouTube's 
accuracy level. <laughs> um, the automatically generated captions in YouTube are about 85% accurate. Although I see a lot more swear words in YouTube captions, so you know, be careful about that. They seem to be getting better all the time. Yeah. I'm I'm amazed sometimes when I look at them just without being captioned on our YouTube site, and it, I'm sure it depends on the person and the subject matter and everything like that. But I've been really impressed lately. Mm -hmm. It's been so much less scrambled than it was even a year or two ago. That's good. That's good, because I mostly use Canvas Studio now. Does anybody in here use Canvas Studio? Mm. It's the bomb. Um, Northwest Nazarene was a beta tester for them, and uh, it's built on screencast-o-matic technology in terms of being able to record yourself. And um, so if you record yourself or upload your own video, that can be captioned in Canvas Studio. If you um, embed a YouTube video through Canvas Studio, it says, no, they have captions out there, so just use those. But oftentimes, those captions are incorrect. And so I will have my TAs go to amara.org. That's a free service. And all you have to do is type in the URL for the YouTube, and it, it basically embeds it into Amara and you clean up the captions, download the SRT file, upload it into Canvas Studio. So. And TechSmith's Camtasia, TechSmith is one of the uh, sponsors here. So um, Camtasia, Camtasia Studio, they also have TechSmith Relay, um, but that tool, there's, I mean, there's tons of tools out there to do the captioning, but um, it is important to get that done. And it takes time, can't do it. 30 seconds over our class times. Oh my gosh, no. 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 I, we worked on an astronomy course this summer, and my portier was just knee deep in Pluto and stargazing and whatever. And, and it, you know, all of the, uh, the accuracy was really off sometimes because those are not normal words that people use, right? So, uh, but it was a lot of fun. She but she would giggle and send me a link to all the funny things that that uh, that Canvas Studio thought it said. So, okay. Which is the best accuracy? Hmm. Is Amara good, or are they, just, are they all running about the same? Amara is bringing in the automatically generated YouTube, uh, captions from YouTube, and if there are no automatically generated captions on a YouTube video, then Amara will let you start fresh, which it's, I mean, it's, it is tedious work, but, um, yeah, I, my experience is Canvas Studio and YouTube are both about 85% accurate, and, and like I said, it's mostly the punctuation, um, it just, it, it may feel like the professor is droning on in a very long sentence, it's like, no, he paused right here, that's the period, and, you know, then do the capitalization for the next sentence. So. Okay, I have some resources in this um, for you to look at. I will be uploading this um, presentation to the Northwest eLearn um, Dropbox, but I'll um, show you a few of these. Canvas actually has some general accessibility design guidelines that are um, pretty universal. It's not just related to Canvas itself. But it repeats a lot of the stuff that I've, mm. that I've mentioned today. So headings, images, and if you are a Canvas user, it does point you to um, the, the Canvas guides where you can learn how to do this stuff. Um, I'm going to use this example link. They have an example link uh, going to a screen reader, and it's going to read this sentence for you. Hopefully the sound will show up. Okay. So the sentence, Donald Tapscott in his paper, Growing Up Digital, HTTP, da 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 says these students.
attached it in this paper growing up digital quote link links to an external site http colon slash slash www.mitsu.edu slash meridian slash jam 98 slash pedum I'm tired already yeah <laughs> okay and here is a good example because it's been embedded on the word or phrase that actually is the link Donald Taxkit and this paper link links to an external site dot growing up digital links to an external site quote says these students so you see the difference there that's all flat technology <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing is that gentleman from Boise State I mean he listened he demonstrated the screen reader to us at about that pace and then we're like well at what pace do you usually listen to it and he sped it up so fast. It was blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, that's the speed you normally listen to? He's like, yeah, no, that's pretty common for, for most of us who are blind. Like, wow. Okay. <laughs> so um, anyway, those are those general accessibility guidelines um, on that Canvas site. And then um, WebAIM is out of Utah State University. And they provide a checklist um, based on the WCAG. And so here is perceivable. Web content is made available to the senses, sight, hearing, and or touch. And then um, their recommendations here. And it also links back to um, uh, the WCAG site. How was Um, tables, a, a lot of people say avoid tables. I don't avoid tables because I build them correctly. <laughs> um, as long as you have a header row in your table, and it, I mean, the one thing is a PowerPoint. I, I haven't been able to find a place to designate a table as a header row in PowerPoint. But in Microsoft Word, Canvas, whatever, um, you usually have that capability, and you say, this is my header row. And that way, when the screen reader reads this, it helps the person know, and they can tab through. If you can tab through in successive order, in other words, dot, 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 like that, then you know your table's good. Where, where people have trouble with tables is they either merge cells or split cells. You see that a lot in like um, in the syllabus and the schedule. Now, here's everything for Tuesday, and here's and, and it's not on it's online. Um, yeah, it can be really hairy for the person trying to read that table. So, as long as you're avoiding merged or split cells, usually your table is going to be okay. Uh, yeah, I use tables for layout purposes. But I'm careful with them. But uh, but I know some places they say just don't use tables. On. No. Yeah. <laughs> if you're careful, you can. Okay. Another resource for you is uh, and notice how I front loaded these um, items here. Instead of saying Web Aim checklist and Web Aim color contrast checker. I wrote checklist from webbing, color contrast checker from webbing. So you've all seen signs. How many of you have seen a sign that maybe has a blue background and red text? You can't read it. It like jumps at you. It's all dancing. Um, but also just the concept of whether the text is uh, con enough contrast in it that makes a difference as to whether it's accessible. And so this color contrast checker, you can come in here and let's say you want to use, um, oh, let's try something. Let's try something purplish. I like the color purple. And let's say our background color is green. 
Well, there's a contrast ratio here of 4.64 to 1. And there's different levels of WCAG guidelines. Um, there's A, 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 and AAA. And on AAA, it would fail. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Um, the, I want to say Section 508 that now points to WCAG. Um, if you're a federal website, you need to make sure your um, your content is compliant with WCAG uh, 2.0 AA. So, so that's what a lot of universities are going toward. Yes. And the readers completely disregard color. When I ask, I'm asking that. There's absolutely no reason because for formal paper, in my field, it can't be. There's no reason for a link to be blue. It's underlined. And that's all you need to see. Correct. But. For your cited users, you want to make sure that your content isn't dancing on the page or... Well, or but my cited... Well, I'm just thinking of the fact that all the links I've ever seen in any of my demonstrations this week, this, this week have all been in blue, but in APA format, you do not have blue mm -hmm. in the middle of your paper. So I just want to make sure that it's not going to cause a problem with the reader. I don't think so. Okay. All right. I don't think so. But but that's also why you don't want to say, just click the green check mark or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And then a last is the WCAG 2.1 guidelines at a glance. And this is on the W3C page. And it's really short and sweet. Um, this is a nice page if you want to get your faculty started or, or your, you and your colleagues started. Um, because going to the actual WCAG guidelines, it's kind of messy. <laughs> But, but this kind of site is, is pretty nice. I've also discovered that the WCAG site has tutorials available. Um, so, so those are good to use. If um, it is almost 20 till, and I think we have until 10 till. So the last, few, the last few minutes here, I'm going to go to my Canvas site and I'm going to actually go to, um, that's on a different page. Yeah, let me go to a different site, the site where I have my banners. It's funny that the laptop kind of died down from all its weirdness. I don't know. <laughs> okay, this is my um, faculty development site, online course design seminar. And so, after the first week, the first week I say go to modules and you know here's how to contact me. But then afterward, I create a module page. I mean, a, just a page that directs them where to go. And each week, I add the next module. And each of these um, has the alt text on it. Um, so you, I don't know if you can see that very well. But if I hover there, there's my alt text. Module 3, drafting the course design map. Oh, that's, a, that's an image. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you created a, like a JPEG or something. Yep. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Do you hide the modules length in the upper, upper left? No. No, they can still just go to modules, um, but I I just do it like that because you know then they can go directly to the module they want to. So, yeah, it it just makes it a little bit more colorful, which I wanted to do something in the color scheme of my university, but not use my university colors because <laughs> if it was complete red, then they couldn't see that if they're colorblind, and so I did the gray with a red outline, so it'd be kind of, sort of, yeah. Reason or personal preference if you start at the bottom and work up? I do this so that they can go to the most current module right now. Okay. But I keep those other modules down there in case, in case they're lagging behind and they're still working on module one, or... Uh, so, so does yeah. this go zero, one degree, or three, two, one, zero? 
says pre-course activity, so I'm guessing you go from bottom to top. I'm not sure I'm following your question. Well, you're, you're releasing them one at a time. Right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, like, first they would get module zero. Yes. And they wouldn't see the others. Then they get module one, but module zero stays there. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what I was asking. That's a preference. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. 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 Because all of this is doing is just providing a link to them to click there to go quickly to the module. So this is now your home, was, sorry, was, was that now your home page? Yes, that was my new home page. My original home page was my welcome. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and I ended up hiding my welcome page. This is my welcome. But you notice here that I have these headers. So the header that is uh, built in. So welcome to the seminar is automatically heading one in Canvas. That's just the way it comes. And then this seminar structure, I don't know if you can see this very well, but it, right up there, header two. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And if you wanted header two, header three, header four to be all the same size, because it won't make the last same size, then you can make them you can change the fonts so they're visibly all the same size. Yes. I, I would, I'm careful about not doing that, but, but yeah, you could. I just, I, I don't like to mess it up too much so that as, if it were another instructor that I were giving this course to, I would feel like they don't know what I've done and, and they're going to mess it up. <laughs> if, if, if the instructor doesn't know the accessibility guidelines, they're just going to think, oh, this is all the same. So uh, I try to do a little training and coaching with that as I go. Okay. Um, for an image in here, the image has alt text. And in Canvas, I have the alt text right here instead of just saying whatever that JPEG name, file name was. But there's also in Canvas decorative image. If I just check that box, then it does those null um, code marks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it'll actually gray out, well, I can just show, it'll gray out that alt text image or line. See how it got grayed out? You probably can't tell very well, but, but it did. So, yeah. When you are actually uploading a um, image in Canvas, you can enter that alt text, right, or enter the, whether it's decorative or not, right there. Here's another, so, yep. That's my husband. He's here with me. Enjoying the beautiful hotel room. I don't know. Y'all stayed at the hotel. It's gorgeous. It's really pretty. Okay, anything else that you would like to see? Um, in Canvas or um, Microsoft Word, Google Docs, Google Docs also has headers. You can do alt text in Google Docs. PowerPoints. I'm sorry? Free up the what? Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Let me think where I have something. Okay. So here's a course design map that a faculty member is working on. And this is title right here. So uh, you can change all of these to whatever you want. Um, there are built-in styles in Google Docs. There's built-in styles in Microsoft Word. Um, I just uh, create them to be whatever I want them to be and then um, say, 
apply or update title to match whatever attributes I just gave it, and then that's my attributes for that. I actually have a Google Docs template so that um, any time that I open up a new Google Docs, it has this structure of those styles. I don't care for the built-in ones because to me they're not visually striking enough. I want a little bit more contrast between my titles and my headings. And it's even worse in Word. In Word, the headings are usually um, a really thin blue. And it's like, uh, that's not going to help. <laughs> so, yeah. And then for making an image, I don't know if I have any images in here. Um, let me just add an image. Hopefully this faculty member is not working on it right now. <laughs> What's she doing? Okay, so if I say insert an image, and I'll choose one from my drive, and I'll just say I'm going to add those purple flowers. Then I come over and right click on it, and there's the alt text field. Now, it depends on the, um, how involved your image is. Usually the title is sufficient and for me to say purple hydrangeas, or if it's the botany class, I'm going to say purple hydrangeas need full sun, whatever. Um, if it's a little bit more involved, um, for instance, in those PowerPoint um, descriptions of, of, you know, maybe you have a flow chart in your PowerPoint. You're going to put a little bit of information in the title and then the description areas where it's going to be the real full details of whatever that image is. So, yep. So you don't have to fill out both fields. I just use title for most things if it's if it's really just basic. Yeah. But. Um, It just depends on how detailed the image is. And, and for instance, a, a course, course where there was um, a pretty detailed flow chart, my, t my TAs had to go in and say, you know, on the left is a, is a, you know, something describing the blue moon, and on the right is something describing the green cheese, I, you know, whatever. We're about out of time, and so I want to thank you for coming today, and do fill out the evaluation on SCED. <laughs> we love evaluations, don't we? Yeah, right, okay. Anyway, thank you very much, and appreciate your time. Technology specialist, believe it or not. And, uh, and uh, so, so more of my work is involved in this. And so, so it's a good refresher and mm -hmm. reminder. Um, and I would like to see if I can't get that to work. Yes. <laughs> so yes. My apologies again. Yeah. Definitely, we don't want to have all the other people in here adding to. Yeah. Having to fight their uh, session like I did. <laughs> okay. I just want to make sure that that logged me out of everything. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Possessed. What was it doing? It was advancing the slides on its own. And and then so it was. It, it seemed like it was stuck, and uh, and those would not work. We couldn't get those to work on it. And so one thing I think could have possibly happened is that somehow. PowerPoint got stuck in auto advance. Oh, and, uh, that. 